PwC is under fire for leaking confidential tax secrets from the government to companies. Former PwC chief executive and a senior colleague quit their roles. With... There's been an egregious breach of trust with others in the industry. It's one of the biggest scandals to ever hit corporate Australia. I think the country is absolutely filthy with PwC. The nation's largest consulting firm illegally used confidential government information to help its clients avoid tax. And at this point of time, who in their right mind would trust the word of PwC? It's just so shocking to me that anyone would behave like this. But this scandal is much bigger than just one firm. It kind of happened in plain sight. To a large extent, Australia's public service was privatised before our very eyes. I mean, everyone has now kind of gone, oh my God, what just happened? On this episode of Four Corners, we go beyond PwC, talking to whistleblowers about a toxic industry that's ripping off taxpayers and trampling our democracy. They're absolutely prepared to break the rules, to be dishonest and ultimately it's taxpayers who are paying for this. What I don't hear is anybody calling it for what it is, an abuse of privilege and power. They are the corporate titans, with salaries and glimmering towers to match. Once dowdy accountants, the so-called Big Four are today household names. PwC, KPMG, EY and Deloitte. In recent years, they've embraced the far more lucrative and secretive world of management consulting. There's no transparency. There is no register of who they're working for anywhere. There is no public access to that information. These are closed worlds which have been operating in their own little empires. Their reach extends from the boardroom to the very heart of government. Australia's spending on consultants is among the highest in the world. Government is the number one customer in the world. Uh, the consultants are pretty much feasting on public service, service delivery, policy advice. It's absolutely pervasive. Consultants are everywhere. While these firms might have slick offices with sweeping views of Sydney Harbour, their biggest client is in Canberra. Over the last decade, Australian governments have paid the big four firms a staggering $10 billion. We find big consultant partners peppered across Australian government departments they're in the senior leadership teams in agriculture, in the federal police, in finance. They're auditors internally for a wide range of government departments. So they're everywhere and they're really big. They're now very much part of the inner circle, but having them so close presents dangers. The PwC scandal has shown that confidential government information is not always safe in private sector hands. We've certainly got a mounting body of evidence which alarms me about the reach of the large consultants into the public sector and the serious consequences for us as citizens, for our democracy, uh, for the value that we get from very big spends um, and for the long-term capability of our public sector. The roof of parliament lends a new perspective to this corporate insurgency. So in Canberra, proximity is actually everything. 
So right down below me here, it's the PWC building, which is closer to Parliament House than most government departments. Back over behind me, it's KPMG, alongside its biggest client, the Department of Defence. In the thick of it here, Ernst & Young. And then back over this side, Deloitte. When it's laid out like this, it really is quite striking. The explosion in the number of consultants followed a cull of 15,000 public servants after the Abbott government came to office in 2013. A cap on recruitment was also imposed. The intention had been to cut costs, but consultants filled the vacuum. Federal government spending on the big four is now six times higher than it was 10 years ago. If you imagine 30 or 40 years of resource stripping from the, the public service, uh, flesh was taken off, got down to the bones. The bones are pretty osteoporotic now uh, as a result of the inroads that consultancy firms have made. It's led probably to much higher levels of spending than in reality could be achieved under, under the traditional system. Well, it was one of those boiling frog problems, you know. Professor Chris Wallace is a historian and former public servant who has watched consultants gradually infiltrate the federal government. And of course, Canberra's a really small place. Uh, Ex-public service friends, ex-staffers, ex-politicians, going to consulting firms, coming back. It's, it's just completely routine in Canberra now and it's pretty much everywhere. It's a revolving door between consultancies and government that keeps all sides employed. Many Politicians, public servants, ex-staffers can be warehoused in consultancies and when government changes or there's regime change of some kind in a particular part of government, they can of course come back from the consultancy, go into the public service department and again be a port of, friendly port of call for consultants they'd previously worked with. This revolving door continues to spin. Despite Labor pledging to curb the influence of consultants, the Albanese government has appointed three department heads straight from the big firms. Blair Comley, running health. He's just spent the past five years at Ernst & Young. Jim Betts, also briefly an EY partner, now heading infrastructure. And Natalie James, in charge of the Department of Employment, after four years with Deloitte. Labor Senator Deborah O'Neill played a key role in starting the parliamentary investigation into the big consulting firms. She's based on the New South Wales Central Coast. You know, once upon a time, people were in awe of these companies. They had them on a pedestal. You know, PwC, ABMG, EY, Deloitte. You know, graduates would fight to get their foot in the door. The reality is, these very secretive partnerships have been shown to be places where there needs to be a lot more transparency, a lot more sunlight. There have been failures from the other of the big four. We know that they share staff. We know that information moves around between them. We know that information moves not only between players in the sector, but between government and into the sector. And I don't think PwC is the only company to have figured out that it might be financially advantaged. It's KPMG that dominates the big government contracts. KPMG's largest public sector client is the Department of Defence, accounting for more than two thirds of its government business. That's $1.3 billion of taxpayers' money that's come its way over the last five years. A 
I'm off to meet a whistleblower who was a senior official at the Department of Defence and claims to have been forced out after raising serious allegations about the infiltration of consultants. The whistleblower won't be identified, fearing reprisals from the department. Instead, they've prepared a statutory declaration for Four Corners. Thanks very much. OK, good luck. Cheers. I've had a quick look at this, and it's pretty interesting stuff. Top line here, serious allegations against KPMG and how they milked the Department of Defence. In just seven months, our whistleblower witnessed KPMG seeking to overcharge defence by at least $1 million. And that was just on a single proposal. The whistleblower claims KPMG charged for work never completed and billed for a consultant who wasn't even on the project. The stat deck went on to say... We discovered that every KPMG invoice reviewed was incorrect. Defence had been consistently overcharged. KPMG wasted a significant amount of public funds enabled by defence personnel, complicit in blindly awarding multiple contract extensions to KPMG with little or no scrutiny. The whistleblower claimed connections helped KPMG win a big contract. KPMG's initial contract for over $14 million was significantly higher than any other tendered price. Within around 12 months, KPMG received well over $4 million in contract extensions. Defence dismissed much of the complaint in 2016, despite the whistleblower providing financial reports and documents. A spokesperson told us that... Defence complies with Commonwealth procurement policy. They added... Procurements made in relation to consulting services must represent value for money. What I don't hear is anybody calling it for what it is, an abuse of privilege and power. Senator O'Neill says consultants are exploiting weaknesses in the public service. These companies, not just in Australia, but around the world, uh, operate a land and expand model where they get in, sometimes underprice the first piece of work, and once they get in, then they expand their reach through familiarity. KPMG has had this land and expand model on full display with defence. Over the last decade, it's won work that was initially valued at $1.1 billion, but later increased to $1.8 billion. That's a $700 million increase. The whole business model of these companies is billable hours. The longer they stay there, the less efficiently they do the job. It's about getting very, very close to government, finding out what's going on, using the contacts, and then growing the business. On a steely winter's morning, in a fishing village outside Melbourne, we meet whistleblower number two. He'd spent two years working for KPMG on defence projects and backs up what our earlier whistleblower told us. A lot of rule breaking had been normalised. He asked not to be identified as he still works in the industry. I absolutely had concerns about the quality of work that uh, KPMG was doing for defence. I would say that KPMG was doing work for defence that ultimately wasn't uh, needed. KPMG was simply happy, in my view, to propose these new works, get them signed off and reap the financial benefits. 
He claims those financial benefits extended to telling KPMG staff to build defence for work that was never performed. I was instructed to record my time spent on internal projects against defence codes. I think KPMG, in my experience, are absolutely prepared to break the rules, to be dishonest, to work in ways that would be unacceptable in normal business, to win more business from the Commonwealth, and ultimately it's taxpayers who are paying for this. He told us KPMG walked a fine line when it came to cooling off periods, designed to prevent firms profiting from confidential government information. In 2019, KPMG hired Peter Corcoran, a senior defence official, to run its government cybersecurity business in Canberra. He was banned from working with defence for 12 months. We obtained an email titled Chocks Away, congratulating Corcoran for creating a storm front of work. The six months seem to have gone incredibly fast. Peter has a further six-month ban from working directly with Defence, but his contribution to date has been immense. Just two paragraphs later, he added, Peter continues to meet Defence personnel on the side, maintaining relationships and building new relationships. He says it was a toxic environment for staff at KPMG. It was pretty vicious um, and competitive. There was a lot of intimidation, harassment and bullying. I was told in one week of three individual cases of harassment. I tried to raise that within KPMG and was pretty much rebuffed. What sort of harassment? Uh, it ranged from sexual harassment to uh, workplace bullying, uh, to making people feel pretty unvalued. Despite being warned that his career would suffer, he contacted the KPMG whistleblowers hotline. Did you get any more work at KPMG? No, I didn't. And my contract wasn't renewed. What's been the cost to you? I lost close to 20 kilos in weight. I lost enamel from my teeth. My legal costs are still increasing and I think in the end I'm likely to have incurred more costs than I ever earned from my work at KPMG. KPMG's chief executive declined to be interviewed. In a statement, the firm said the whistleblower's complaints had nothing to do with his contract not being renewed. KPMG said it had investigated claims made by a former contractor in 2019 and there was no evidence to support overbilling of defence. As to Peter Corcoran's continued contact with his old colleagues, KPMG said, we have reviewed this matter and it is clear there was no breach of the contractual cooling off period. Over the last decade, KPMG's defence business has soared. Its annual defence billings peaked at almost $450 million last year, a six-fold increase. This has coincided with KPMG's targeting of former defence staff. Four Corners research shows that over the last five years, almost 100 former defence staff have moved to KPMG. You know if you've got a, a very senior public servant with that immense, deep, departmental knowledge and extraordinary Rolodex, you know, they know everybody, uh, they're a familiar face that the consultant can then roll into the department when pitching for work. It just raises the degree of comfort that government departments have when hiring consultants. And of course, it's a two-way street. Good morning, welcome to AM, I'm Sabra Lane. I think if you go right and then left, I'm on my way to see one of the senators who's made it her business to follow the money. Green Senator Barbara Pocock helped kick off the Senate inquiry. And the Defence Department is squarely in her sights. I just ran into Senator O'Neill, so Labor have moved for another new uh, piece of inquiry. 
consultants breed secrecy, she says, enabling governments to avoid accountability. You can sit here. OK, good. You're there. Yeah. For every dollar that you spend on a consultant, you remove the possibility that a senator can ask a question in estimates. Why about, is that? Or you, they're, not, they're not exposed to estimates. They aren't exposed to questions on notice unless they're in, inside an inquiry and affected by an inquiry. So a whole lot of the key transparency devices and tools for our parliament are prevented from really looking at uh, the big spend on consultants. Big impact on democracy. Has that undermined democracy? It has certainly undermined democracy, absolutely. And you have to ask, is one of the intentions of moving so much of the government spend outside the public view is a deliberate strategy to give uh, certain governments, um, you know, cover for what they want to do? We've certainly got a mounting body of evidence which alarms me about the reach of the large consultants into the public sector. Defence is a black box for many of us uh, who look at government and I think we need a lot more transparency, a lot more accountability and evaluation of the contracting services into defence and more broadly. Do you need to go and vote? I do. Looks okay. like a red... Yes. OK, good. OK. Um, so here we go. Sorry to interrupt. We might walk with you if we'll that's OK. Walk, walk with me. Come with me. After just a year in the Senate, Barbara Pocock has locked onto her target. I really think we're Australian taxpayers being ripped off and it's unethical. The dash. I was beginning to wonder how the consultancies had managed to keep us in the dark for so long. I'm back in Melbourne to meet a man who I hoped might have some answers. Adam Evans is himself a consultant. So why are people so angry about what you've done? I think we've probably broken the code, right? It was just... As the owner of a small firm, he's miffed at how the big guys dominate government work. Democratising the data and giving it to people to enable them to ask more questions, I think is going to make, um, has made some people uncomfortable. I'd heard it's hard to find out how much taxpayer money the big consulting firms are really getting. Adam Evans says they shuffle between multiple business names and numbers. KPMG, his prime example. KPMG is referred to a lot of different ways. It has at least a dozen different business names registered. In practical terms, what does it mean to the average person trying to, trying to understand how government money is spent? It makes it very, very hard to understand from the government's page, the government's website, um, how, if, as KPMG is the example, how many contracts they've been awarded, what the value is, and what they were called when the contract was awarded. His database also shows KPMG's success at upselling the federal government. There's been nearly 4,000 contracts issued over the 10-year period, totalling $1.64 billion, with um, 1,904 contract amendments. That's nearly $1 billion in additional revenue for KPMG. It's about a 60% uplift of the original contract values. Wow, that's, that's a lot of money. That's a significant amount of money. It's Management Advisory 101. Get a contract and make it longer um, and sell more people in. Um, it's, it's a strategy of increasing revenue and profit. Um, generally intended to keep pace with the client's needs, they would be looking to increase their revenue, their market share and their dominance. Um, five consultants on billable work is worth a lot more money to the shareholders than one. Do you think that the interests of the consultant don't necessarily always align with the interest of the Commonwealth? It's a very tricky um, relationship to, to navigate. <laughs> Uh, 
Australia's tax office is itself navigating this tricky terrain. It has no shortage of consultants moving in and out of its revolving doors. The upper echelons of the tax office are stacked with former consultants. Amazingly, two of them, whose salaries are funded by us taxpayers, are still receiving payment from their former employers. The ATO has confirmed this to us, but refused to disclose their identities. It's a conflict of interest. And, and even if it's declared, how do you manage that properly? Right, so these are conflicts of interest that are now being discovered as people look more and more. Tax Commissioner Chris Jordan spent a decade as chairman of KPMG New South Wales. His second in charge, Jeremy Hershorn, also came from KPMG. Two other senior managers came over from EY. And three of the ATO's top IT people were previously employed by tech consultancy Accenture. Two of them still hold shares in the company, which has won $1.4 billion worth of work from the tax office over the past decade. The ATO told us they have a robust framework and process for managing conflicts of interest. And less than 10% of its senior executives had come from the big consultancies. The consulting firms are your major alternative employer and they pay extremely well. So this is where the moral hazard starts to arise. Uh, if you're in a public service position and you're dealing with consultants and you think, well, that's my alternative employer, are you going to be a bit more keen to hire them? PwC is a case study in just how cosy these relationships can be. Hi, I'm James Downey. I'm the CEO of the Independent Hospital Pricing Authority. Until mid last year, James Downey headed an independent government agency that advises on the price of hospital services and medical equipment. PwC was a consultant to his agency. As well as working for the health agency, PwC also worked for the very companies who could profit from the agency's pricing advice. When conflicts of interest like this arise, the big firms say they have checks and balances in place to protect their clients. I think the notion of sterile corridors is laughable. And I can tell you that many of the whistleblowers who ring to me and ring me and talk about conflicts of interest think they are laughable. People have lunch together, they socialise together, they exchange information. We're humans. When James Downey left his government job, you guessed it, he joined PwC. Now he's back with the health pricing body. This time, as a PwC consultant. PwC said it has rules and processes to manage conflicts of interest. James Downey said the health pricing body did not require him to complete a cooling off period. The idea behind hiring consultants was to bring some business savvy to an inefficient public service, to make the bureaucracy more responsive. But in many cases, the opposite has happened, especially on big projects. For consultants, there's few more lucrative jobs than overhauling a government IT system. In early 2020, Deloitte landed just such a job and struck it big with a deal that would increase almost five-fold in value. But it is how Deloitte won this deal that is now under serious scrutiny. Those who lost their jobs in the pandemic flood Centrelink offices and the MyGov website as the government backflips on claims the site was hacked. Deloitte was tasked with upgrading the MyGov website after it was overwhelmed at the start of the pandemic.
there's lots of property questions that need answers there. Um, none of it looks good to me. In March 2020, Deloitte signed a contract with the federal government's Digital Transformation Agency. The contract wasn't even awarded in writing. It was granted verbally and without a competitive tender. That contract would start at nine and a half million dollars, then balloon to 28 million. All up, Deloitte's work on the project would cost taxpayers $47 million. The Auditor General was scathing. He said the Deloitte contract failed in 12 areas of evaluation, including offering taxpayers value for money. It was revealed Deloitte charged daily consulting rates above those recommended by the agency, and its payments were not even linked to results. A government audit earlier this year found MyGov fell well short of what had been promised. Although other parties had worked on the project, a source with direct knowledge of it said it would have been easier if Deloitte had never been involved. Deloitte also declined our invitation for an interview. In a statement, the firm said it was proud of its work on the MyGov website. It said appropriate procurement processes were followed. It blamed the cost increases on software licences and changes requested by the government. Look, profit was number one and every time I... Brendan Lyon knows how enmeshed the big consultancies are with government and how they use these relationships to profit handsomely. If ever you need to back a horse, you back the horse called self-interest. He was a partner at KPMG until 2021, but made the mistake of giving frank and fearless advice to the New South Wales government on its rail assets. It wasn't what the government wanted to hear. So they're using consultants to get the answer they want, essentially. Well, I mean, I think in many instances that we're saying they're starting with the answer and then there is a process of evidence making that goes around it. There's a huge amount of pressure to get the answers that are needed. For Brendan Lyon, the required answer was an accounting fudge cooked up by the New South Wales government. The plan was to understate the cost of maintaining the rail assets to make the state budget appear far healthier than it actually was. When Brendan Lyon wouldn't go along with this, a new report was commissioned, which said what the New South Wales government wanted to hear. The profession exists so that we can all have trust in the way that corporations, not-for-profits, governments and everybody else account for the monies that they have. I guess if we start to see an erosion in ethics and professional standards in one side of the business, it's very hard to say that that's not going to be a risk across the rest of it. So what were you forced out for? I was forced out because I wouldn't play the game because I upset the then New South Wales Treasury Secretary because I wouldn't sign off on results that misstated the state's accounts by $10 billion. What does it tell us how the big consulting firms operate? I'd say that it was not the sort of culture where bad news was welcomed. It was more of a glee club around revenue and uh, no questions asked about what you're going to do for it. I guess I was just surprised by the, you know, by the naked motivation to get cash to ensure that the firm is continuing to turn over more than $2 billion a year. The Auditor General eventually forced the New South Wales government to correct this budget fudge. KPMG has faced no sanction. In my example, every single person that was involved on the other side is in a more senior position than they were at the time. That shows that there is no consequence internally, there's no consequence professionally. KPMG has acknowledged that mistakes were made, but rejects many of Brendan Lyon's allegations. 
KPMG said it complied with guidelines on conflicts of interest and professional ethics. I felt taxpayers were owed a better explanation about how their billions have been spent. So we've come here to one of Sydney's wealthier suburbs to ask KPMG Chief Executive Andrew Yates not only about the money, but also about the allegations of misconduct we've heard from three separate whistleblowers. Let's go and see if he's home. KPMG Australia earned more than $2 billion in revenue last year. It's the only big four firm that has not disclosed how much its chief executive is paid. The other three pay their CEOs between $2.5 million and $4.5 million a year. Uh, the dogs are in, but he doesn't appear to be. These big firms don't have to front up to shareholders, file accounts, or it seems, talk to us. The rise of the so called consultocracy has coincided with an increasingly insecure public service. Chris Wallace has seen this firsthand. You need to kind of remember how the system used to work. The, the public service in a traditional Westminster system, which we had, is permanent, it's merit-based, it's completely apolitical, and you're there for life. Uh, and at the very top, departmental heads could give frank and fearless advice because they weren't in fear of losing their job. Uh, but in recent decades, that's ended. Departmental heads are now on five-year contracts. So if you're a senior public servant, everybody knows if you tell the truth and it's not what you, your minister wants to hear now, you'll get fired. Do you think governments like consultants because they give them the answer they want? Put yourself in a consultant's shoes. You want to get repeat billings, right? Repeat business is the most profitable. If you tell a government what it doesn't want to hear, are you going to get rehired? That's what happened to Brendan Lyon. Standing up to KPMG came at great personal cost. I am not a perfect human being. I'm not trying to say that I sort of walk around like ethical Jesus, but when you're being asked to do something that you know is wrong, it's sometimes time just to stand up and do the right thing. When you're facing a lot of pressure, you do things that you need to do to cope. You drink too much, you smoke too much, you, you spend periods of time inside with all the windows shut thinking about how it could be different. Look, I lost about 29 kilograms in an eight month period because of the pressure that was on me. That's not healthy. The mental health impacts were material and ongoing. The consultants know winter has arrived. The Albanese government has pledged to cut its spending on consultants and contractors by $3 billion over the next four years. And the new National Anti-Corruption Commissioner has signalled consultants are squarely in his sights. You know, we've all been slow to join the dots to work out what's really going on here. This is not about a few consultants behaving badly. It's about the systematic replacement of a once fearless public service with voracious private sector operators, driven by profit, not public good. The question is, is it too late to fix it? 
I think we need stronger governance of what's going on. When things go wrong, I think we need real consequences. Now, I grew up on a Mallee farm where my dad measured value in bags of wheat and bales of wool. We're a long way from that. And I know, as a taxpayer, and uh, I've lived my life amongst ordinary people, they are horrified and they're in my inbox every day now saying, what is going on? What is this money for? Why are we spending so much on basic activities? You've got to have consultants. And, and even back in the day, uh, before the system started decaying, uh, consultants were sometimes used. The, the public service cannot possibly have every single element of expertise in a deep and timely way all the time. And using public sector advice wisely in conjunction with limited consulting input, fantastic. But this pervasion, this absolute permeation of the public service as a whole has really led to a decay in standards of advice, of integrity. And, you know, without systemic change, it's, it's going to be very difficult to turn around. Mm -hmm.